Bruce Collette really knows Hebrew, but tonight it's all about taverns, and, and I'm ready for that. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I did when I came in was I started to pass out a recipe from Martha Washington's cookbook. And I don't know where they went to, but I hope everyone got one. And the reason I wanted to do that was both so that I didn't come empty handed, but gave you something you could bring home. But also to make the point that in colonial America, early national period, uh, they were very comfortable with alcohol, with alcoholic drinks. Uh, public drunkenness was frowned upon, but there was no moral strictures against consuming alcohol. They were very comfortable with it. So, uh, just to show you, our first first lady uh, had a pretty good recipe there. If, you, if you're not subject to heart trouble, you might try it. I don't know, it was pretty rich with the cream. And I will actually allude to it in my talk. Uh, can we have the lights out now? <coughs> How do the lights go out? I was going to come back around. Uh, thank you. I'll do it. Okay. I think you'll be able to see the slides better that way. Wow. Jeez, I'm not moving now. Now, uh, Adam from the uh, uh, community television is here. It's going to be filming this. So you want to just check and make sure that's going to come out? Does that look good? Yeah, I can't see you, but I can see the PowerPoint. I don't want you to see me. All right. You can hear <laughs> that's me. good. And that's, you can see the slide. Yeah, it comes out great. Okay. Yep. Okay, good. Should well, we leave one light on or no? Something. Or do you like it this way? Not for all of them. No. It's almost Halloween. Let's make it spooky. Yeah. 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 First off, the terminology tavern. The terms tavern and inn were pretty much interchangeable in early America. Uh, there was no real distinction. Another word that was used for these places that was quite common was hotel. And a hotel, a tavern, and inn, all the same thing, except if you called your place hotel, it meant you were kind of being a little hoity and aspiring to sound French, which we all know must be better, right? But uh, I will use the terms uh, tavern and inn pretty much interchangeably because that's what the people at the time did. Now, other terms for this would be ordinary, uh, public house, those terms were used to a lesser extent in New England, but they all pretty much meant the same thing. So, what was a tavern? In short, a tavern was an ordinary house, only more so. Uh, a tavern was, could be any house. It was very difficult to tell just from the outside what was a tavern and what wasn't a tavern. Uh, and uh, once in a while, a building might be purposefully built as a tavern, but most of the time they were just converted to ordinary houses. Sometimes these houses that were taverns were very small. This is a little house in Granby that was a tavern for many, many years. And if you know Norwich, there was a, a, a bar near the Friendlies in Norwich, in Norwich Town. It looked a lot like this. It was only taken down about 10 years ago. And that too was a tiny little house that served as a tavern. It was on the inside that a tavern was a little different from an ordinary house. Uh, at a minimum, there would be one room of that house that would be devoted to uh, a place where people could come and drink and meet people and read newspapers and do all the other things that occurred in these taverns. And that was called either the bar room or the tap room. And on uh, this house, I don't know if I have a laser pointer, probably not. On this house you can see uh, on the chimney on the right, the room behind that is called the tap room. And it had its own entrance. There was an entrance to the house in the front, 
in an entrance directly into the tap room on the back. So because you had to devote at least one room to the tavern activity, uh, it meant that most taverns were on the larger side uh, where they could afford the space. But many, many of these taverns had just one room that served as the tap room or bar room. In some cases, it got a little fancier. Here we have a couple of parlors and uh, a dining room uh, that uh, all were part of the tavern operation. You know, I usually start these talks by saying, mute your cell phone. <laughs> and I did that once, and I was giving my talk, and all of a sudden I heard, ring, 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 and it was my cell phone. <laughs> so uh, hopefully no one will call me. Um, what was meant by the bar in those days was not the counter that we think of now. We think of you go into a place as a counter with stools in front of it, we call that the bar. But what they called the bar was the locked place where the liquor was stored. And the landlord or landlady of that tavern would have a key to that and would bring out the liquor uh, when someone ordered some, some, something to drink but otherwise it was kept locked. And it could be a, a very small space, like in this tower, where over there on the right, you see one of the closets flanking the fireplace has been made into a liquor storage place. And that was the locked bar. Uh, this is another style that was quite common in early America, where it was kind of like an area within that big tap room that was walled off and sort of had this open grill and a locked door. And that was the bar. So the landlord would keep a, a close eye and maybe keep the, keep the thing locked, depending on how well, I guess, you knew the people that were there. Um, in, here in Hebron, you know this house, right? This is yes. the Peter's house on East Street. Uh, this is kind of interesting because this house has a fantastic ballroom on the second floor. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but uh, especially after the turnpikes got going and travel increased, taverns got to be a little fancier, a little larger, and in addition to the specialized space for the bar room, there might be a place for entertainments, for dances, for traveling uh, entertainments, uh, and that was usually referred to as a ballroom. This house has a ballroom. Now, when Marion Terry wrote her book, Old Inns of Connecticut, in the 1930s, she says that the, the, um, the Elton Post House was a tavern in Hebron. And she gives a description of it that matches this. And we know from the deed research that was, has been done that the Post family did eventually acquire this. So that kind of confirms that that ballroom was part of the tavern operation. But I don't know the exact dates uh, when this was just a private home and when it was a tavern. Many of these places were taverns for a long time, and sometimes a second generation, a third generation would take them over. Others were a tavern for a short time, or they went back and forth from being just a private home to a house that also included a tavern. So it's a very fluid situation in most cases. I will show you, however, how to tell with pretty good certainty what houses were taverns and which ones were not, even if they didn't have fancy ballrooms. That's because tavern keepers needed to be licensed. From the, uh, pretty much the earliest days in Connecticut, right up through the 1830s, uh, anyone that proposed to be a tavern keeper had to be licensed. The licenses were, uh, took the form of being nominated as a tavern keeper. Each town nominated people to be tavern keepers for one year. And then the next year, probably the same people, but maybe someone different, maybe someone would drop out, would be nominated again. 
These nominations were sent to the county court, in Hebron's case, Holland County Court, uh, Holland being the seat of the county, and the judges of the court would approve the tavern licenses for that year. So the year is January 1814, and it says, at the meeting of the justices of the peace, selectmen, constables, and grand jurors of the town of Hebron convened this third day of January, 1814, at the dwelling house of Mr. David Post in said Hebron, voted to nominate and recommend the following persons as tavern keepers in said town of Hebron for the year ensuing. And the tavern keepers are Roger Fuller, Anson Gillette, Hezekiah Bissell, Samuel Peters, David Post, and John Payne. So, Hebron's not a really big town at this point, but there are one, two, three, four, five, six, six taverns in town. So you probably didn't go too far in Hebron before you came across a tavern. Now, a couple of interesting things. Uh, first of all, uh, you notice that one of the Peters family is one of the uh, nominated taverners. Notice that David Post is a tavern keeper. The person whose house this great meeting occurs to nominate the tavern keepers itself is occurring at a tavern. Why? Because if you're going to get the justices of the peace, the selectmen, the constables, and the grand jurors all together in one place, you need a place to meet. Taverns were places to meet. It, not just go and drink and, and, and so forth, but they were a sort of meeting place for large numbers of people. Another thing, uh, this Anton Gillette, he was one of the selectmen. So he's, in a sense, endorsing himself as one of the tavern keepers. You know, I don't think it was a conflict of interest. I think it was just, you know, what they expected to do in those days. Again, there was no shame to being a tavern keeper. It was, you know, it was probably part of that community leadership that he had. He was a selectman, he ran the tavern, provided a place for people to meet and socialize. That probably gave him extra status as one of the town leaders. Uh, lastly, Roger Fuller in 1814 is still a tavern keeper here in Hebron. And uh, Ms. Foote emailed me a very interesting uh, account of the Caesar and Lois Peters abduction in which Roger Fuller's tavern played a part. And I'll say some more about that. But it shows that, you know, it's pretty, uh, it, it could be a pretty good deal, and, it, it, and people did pursue the tavern keeping trade for a long time in many cases. These licenses, I don't know if they're on microfilm, but they're all at the State Library in Hartford. And you can pull them out year by year by year and make a list of the Hebron tavern keepers and figure out where these people lived at the time, if you got the good deed research and, and so forth, and you can pretty well figure it out from there. I said a tavern was a house only more so, because it was a very domestic operation. You provided drink, you provided food, and you provided for the non-local people that might be stopping there for travelers, a place to sleep. So you had the, or the things of an ordinary house. You had what ordinary people had, but you had a lot more of it. So you, you didn't just have one or two tables like most families did. You needed you know three or four small tables, a couple of big tables in the house. Um, you wanted to be sure to have enough beds in case some large party of travelers stopped. So taverns tended to have beds tucked away in all the different rooms so that if you needed to, you could provide overnight accommodations. Incidentally, uh, if you didn't have enough beds, no problem. Because in those days, people would sleep together, multiple people would sleep together in a bed, even strangers. Yeah. So if you were, you know, taking a stage trip through Connecticut, and the, the, there was always room at the end because you could always squeeze one more person into the bed, and people slept fully clothed, 
and this even applies to women. There's a, a book by a, a woman named Frances Knight, I believe, who recounts her trip from Boston to New York, and she stayed at taverns and, you know, slept with people of both sexes, depending on how crowded it was. Uh, there was, uh, people were comfortable with something that we might not be comfortable with today. Why? Because in the 18th century especially, people didn't have the sense of, or the expectation of privacy that we have. They grew up in these small houses with big families and, and everybody knowing their business and everything else. They didn't have the same intense sense of privacy and boundaries that we did. So they were accepting of, well, you've got to stay somewhere, you're not going to sleep out in the rain, so Mr. Smith seemed nice, I'll just get in bed. <laughs> Hopefully nothing happens. <laughs> At any rate, so another way we know about these taverns is through the probate records. Uh, in Connecticut, when someone died, uh, if they had any property at all, the system was that they would value their estate. And certain uh, people in town, usually prominent people, often neighbors, would be appointed to go and inventory all of a person's possessions. And they got pretty specific, in some cases down to even listing the titles of books and religious tracts and so forth. Uh, but in the case of taverns where we have a probate inventory, uh, you can see how, uh, how much more stuff they had than the ordinary family, just to be able to run that operation. So you see it starts with, uh, uh, starts with chairs and uh, two fall leaf uh, dining tables, a square pine table in the bar. Uh, a round fall table, a breakfast table, uh, a cherry tree tea table. So, you know, that's a lot of furniture. Even though you can't tell a house it was a tavern from the outside, if you went in, you would have realized that it's only because of all the <coughs> furniture that were needed to run a tavern. Lots of tables, lots of chairs uh, to provide seating. The other thing is, uh, you needed the uh, 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 vessels for serving and storing liquor. So you find in these inventories of tavern owners just great gobs of, of glass, of decanters, of uh, mugs, teapots, bowls, drinking goblets, uh, um, more than the more than you could justify just for an individual family. Now, how many people know how to find a tavern? Well, obviously, all the locals knew, right? Because they, they knew who uh, was running a uh, tavern uh, where you, if you could go locally for a drink. And it was taverns, uh, the local function of taverns was not just as a place to go to be served a drink, but it was also a place that kind of acted as a liquor store. So townspeople would bring in their bottles and have them filled with rum or gin or whiskey or whatever, and pay the tavern keeper and take the bottle back, and then they'd have a bottle for the rest of the week, or however long it took to get through it. And sometimes archaeologically, uh, I'm the historian that works for a group of archaeologists, sometimes the uh, the, archae the archaeologists have found liquor bottles with people's initials scratched in them. That's so when you brought it to the tavern, if they didn't fill it right away, you could come back for it in, in a day or two and they knew whose bottle uh, was who, was uh, who, what, how does that end? Whose bottle was, anyway, they knew who the bottle belonged. Uh, one way that people knew where to find a tavern were the almanacs. A lot of almanacs published in big cities like Boston, smaller cities like New London and Hartford, and oftentimes they'd have a section in the back, and they would list taverns, usually by route. So they'd say, if you're going from New London to Albany to New York, here are the taverns along the route that you can stop. I don't know if you had to pay to get in the Almanac, but I suspect you did. 
because I know from doing research in Lebanon that some of the Lebanon taverns were in these almanacs and some were not. So that suggests to me that it was kind of like, uh, you know, like any travel guide, you maybe paid to get some mention in it. But they would list taverns. Another way that people might find out about taverns, depending on what part of the country they were traveling through, were these road atlases. This is Christopher Cole's Road Ad Atlas, published in the 1790s. In, it was kind of like a AAA triptych, if you're old enough to remember the triptych that you folded. These were strip maps that you kind of went like this from one to the other. And along the way, uh, the map would show you all the, cap all the taverns um, indicated uh, beside the road. So that was another way of knowing uh, where you might be able to stop. Incidentally, when the French army marched through Connecticut in 1781, they very carefully made maps and noted all the taverns on the maps. And the reason they did that was because officers were not supposed to sleep in tents uh, in the campground. They were supposed to be put up in houses, uh, taverns, or private homes. So they uh, very carefully sort of plotted out where they could find enough houses every night for the officers to be accommodated. And uh, uh, the French officers uh, were very dismissive, although they liked the Americans, they were very dismissive of two things. One, the wine they were served here, and as a consequence, many of them brought wagons full of wine for their own consumption. And uh, they hated the bread, which was uh, molasses or cornbread or something like that. It just didn't measure up the French standards. But I did it Another way were the ubiquitous uh, um, tavern signs. These were a major form of art in the period, and they kind of allowed people that might not have the highest level of literacy to figure out where they were. Uh, George Washington on his horse was a uh, common motif. Uh, sometimes it would be just a sort of pictorial uh, uh, representation of food, drink, and a place to hang your hat, as you can see, the stranger's resort. That was another word, by the way, <laughs> resort. You know, you wonder how much of a resort this place was. But, uh, and then in Sensbury, the, uh, uh, I think it was Anson Phelps Inn, which was also known as the Red Lion Inn. And you can see that the Red Lion, either the Tavern was named after the sign, or the sign reflected the name of the tavern. We don't know which. However, Connecticut has one of the country's best collections of these tavern signs in Hartford at the Connecticut Historical Society on Elizabeth Street. And it's just fantastic to go there. And I don't know if they have any from Hebrew in them, but uh, it's a, a great place to go. So uh, you could find out, if you were going to make a long overland trip, you could find out uh, some, from some sources where the places to stay were. And if you just ambled along, you would find uh, these signs indicating that what perhaps might look like an ordinary house was in fact a place where you could stop, get something to eat, something to drink, and also a bed, though not necessarily a private bed for the night. Now what went on in these taverns? This is a early 19th century view of a typical tavern, and you see the bar, the enclosed area, with a screen and a drop-down uh, panel that uh, could be locked to uh, secure the liquor. You see the people at various tables, and they're drinking. The first thing, of course, that these taverns did was serve as a place to drink. You see people drinking out of wine glasses, out of mugs, and if you look closely on the shelf, you'll see some punch bowls. Um, not all the drink that was served in early taverns was served uh, in, in individual vessels. These people, I, I guess, all have individual vessels. See the punch bowl on the shelf, though? Now, in this view, you definitely see a, a, a punch bowl. What were the drinks of early America? Well, surprisingly, uh, brew, brewing beer and ale, stout, porter, 
that was kind of a home activity rather than a commercial activity. So people might have beer that they made at home, but that wasn't uh, that was a very small part of drinking in taverns. Uh, much more common were um, the kinds of wines like sherries and Madeira that kept well, and above all, rum. There also was whiskey. Um, hardly any breweries in 18th century <coughs> Connecticut, uh, but there were dozens of distilleries. I don't know if there are any in Hebrew or not, but it would be interesting to know that. What did they distill? They distilled uh, apple cider into an apple jack, a very hard, high alcoholic content apple drink. They um, distilled grain into whiskey, and they made something called country gin. Um, country gin, kind of unique to New, New England, um, are any of you gin lovers, gin and tonic in that summer? So what is gin flavored with? Juniper. Juniper, right? Other stuff, bergamot and, and too, but the main flavoring of gin is juniper. Uh, country gin was made by taking grain alcohol and flavoring it with pine pitch. <coughs> so uh, I guess it was maybe a cheaper and not necessarily a high quality gin, but uh, that was another drink that they would have at these taverns. Another drink uh, would be various kinds of punch, uh, alcohol mixed with fruit, with eggs, like eggnog, to make an eggnoggy thing, and uh, something called posset. And I distributed Michael Washington's posset recipe. Posset would be heavy on the alcohol, heavy on the sugar, heavy on the cream, maybe mix in half dozen eggs or something, and uh, and uh, that was a drink that was very popular, and it was a communally shared drink. There was actually a specific vessel, and I'll show one later on, called the posset pot, and it would be passed from one person to another. Just as they were not faced by sharing beds upstairs at night, they didn't have the germ compunctions that we do. They didn't even know about germs. And so they would pass the uh, they would pass the pot from one to another, and each would take a sip or two, and it would move on. Hang on, did I do that right? Uh, Hebron contributes to the history of uh, uh, what they drank in taverns by this very interesting receipt. And uh, during the Caesar. Peter's episode, uh, I think you all know the story, but just in a nutshell, uh, the Reverend Samuel Peters uh, uh, was uh, attempting to sell the people that he considered his slaves, and uh, this was a few years after the American <coughs> Revolution, and a person from the South came uh, to abduct those slaves and, uh, and uh, uh, bring them away from Hebron. The townsfolks of Hebron were incensed at this, and they formed a posse, they went to Norwich, and they came up with this ruse that uh, one of the Hebronites uh, claimed that the Peters owed him money, and uh, therefore they had to be arrested and returned to Hebron. When they got back to Hebron, they all went to Fuller, Roger Fuller's Tavern. Again, the tavern is the center of social life, uh, and celebrated. Roger Fuller then submitted a bill for the celebration, and it's interesting. Now, um, Ms. Foote <coughs> sent me a, a transcript of this, and I, I don't have enough to like to read it, so I'm going to try to read it off the screen. But at uh, any rate, uh, there's a gill of brandy, there is, uh, uh, looks like eight pints uh, cherry, Cherry rum. rum. Cherry rum. Yeah. Another three pints of cherry rum. A uh, bowl of cider. Probably that was hard cider. Some horse bait, which I guess was for putting up the horses, and then another quart of rum. So uh, it all came to nineteen shillings and some pence. And I understand that. Uh, 
that he never did collect on this. But it, it tells you, you know, there's no beer mentioned, there's no gin or whiskey mentioned. It was pretty much rum and cider that, uh, and some brandy that uh, people were celebrating with in those days. Another thing that went on in taverns was newspapers. Because the stages went by, they would deliver out-of-town newspapers. And you could go to <coughs> taverns and find the newspapers and catch up on the news. Uh, they would share the newspapers, pass them from one to another. Now, newspapers in those days never had any local news because everybody knew the local news. But if, so if you read a paper from Norwich or New London or Wyndham even, uh, it would primarily be news of the world and news of the rest of the country. This is how people kept track of things. Uh, there would be political polemics in the news. There were Republican newspapers, or Federalist newspapers, I should say, and there were anti-Federalist newspapers. Uh, then Whigs and Democrats, uh, finally Republicans and Democrats. Newspapers were very, very partisan. If you read uh, Chernow's book on Alexander Hamilton, he was always churning out these essays that would be reprinted in newspapers across what was then the country, which is to say up and down the eastern seaboard. So you could find out what was happening in Boston, what was happening in New York, what was happening in Virginia, and even Great Britain and Europe by spending a little time at the tavern where you could find these newspapers. Here's another view. A uh, poster on the wall <laughs> advertising something. And of course, uh, the taverns provided a place to stop and stay. Here we see a view of a tavern, and there's a coach outside, and the people from away, again, bearing news, perhaps. Uh, these coaches might also carry mail for local residents. Uh, but there would be some people that were stopping there to eat and, and sleep as well. Another thing that went on at taverns, particularly after 1800, was they were places of traveling entertainment. And that entertainment might be acrobats, it might be animals. Columbus the elephant, you know, toured New England. And um, the way it worked is, uh, you, the tavern provided a place for this spectacle and the uh, proprietor of the elephant would sell tickets and then the proceeds would be split with the tavern owner. So taverns were uh, just a, a whole lot of traveling things. There's a, uh, do you know, uh, uh, I think it's uh, part of uh, Burrowville, Rhode Island. There's a little sign that says, Sight of the First Elephant Shot in Rhode Island. <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. It turns out that it was one of these traveling menageries and some misguided youth shot the elephant. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Another thing that went on at taverns um, were local entertainers, dances. I mentioned the ballroom in the Peters house. Uh, people would get together for dances, and uh, some of the taverns went so far as to have a special stage for musicians, or even an elevated box for musicians. And so the top, it would always be on the top floor. You'd have a big open space on the top floor where people could come and dance. You'd have some people playing the fiddle. The fiddler's kind of on the right there. Um, maybe a couple of fiddlers. And then, uh, particularly if you were too shy to dance, you could go downstairs to the tap room, get a few slugs of rum, and maybe then you felt more like dancing. Although you probably would be less coordinated. <laughs> well, the next part of the show that I want to go uh, through is uh, what we find archaeologically from these taverns. And uh, a group I work with, Public Archaeology Survey Team, uh, has um, done uh, substantial archaeology at two tavern sites in Connecticut and some smaller investigations of a couple more. And it's interesting. 
the archaeology confirms what we learned from the probate inventories and uh, 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 what we know from other documentary sources. Um, here's the Alden Tavern uh, location on the Lebanon Green. And it's right next to the uh, meeting house, sort of reflecting its centrality for that community. By the way, a lot of towns adopted ordinances that public notices of town meetings or town actions had to be posted at the meeting house and at all the taverns in town. The idea being that either in the church or in the taverns you'd get, everybody would know about what was going on if you posted notices in those two places. So here's our archaeology team. Uh, going over the site of that tavern, uh, having removed some of the topsoil. And uh, we were able to uh, find the uh, foundation stones for the house itself, uh, which we sort of knew about through photographs. But also, we found a tremendous number of artifacts. Liquor bottles, or fragments of liquor bottles. And remember, the archaeologist is just as pleased by a fragment as by a whole thing, uh, because it's the information that they're after. So tons and tons of liquor bottles. Taverns would be buying their rum, possibly in barrels, but also uh, in bottles. Certainly the Madeira, the sherry, the wine came in uh, what were called case bottles. Uh, some of these bottles had, uh, were sort of square so that they would pack and be capable of being shipped by boat, by, by sea. Uh, lots of bottles. Drinking glasses. These are all broken, of course, but uh, no way one family would have this many wine glasses at a time. It's kind of the signature of taverns. The number of wine glasses or, uh, and other vessels that you find in great profusion. This is a little piece of window glass that's made into a gaming token for a game like backgammon, where you know you have to keep uh, count of the game uh, with a, uh, a token. Also, you find many more pipes than you would ever find in an ordinary house. Remember this picture? Look at that. You know, I mean, they're smoking away there, right? Uh, see the ex the pipe. Each Person's got a pipe or two on the table, and one guy's got his going. Pipes would be shared communally as well. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of tableware, pretty nice tableware too. And incredible ceramics. Because in order to attract people to your tavern and to get a good reputation, particularly with the traveling public, you just didn't want to have ordinary stuff. You wanted to have um, the better grade of stuff. And people in Connecticut, particularly those that are close to seaports like Norwich or New Haven or Hartford, uh, could get these imported uh, ceramics. So there's German Westerwald, there's British uh, ceramics, as there's, uh, we frequently find uh, uh, English white glazed stoneware uh, in these uh, tavern sites. Really extra nice. Um, tea, of course, even uh, it might have be, even been more popular than liquor. Uh, from about 1740 on, Americans drank vast quantities of tea, which is why the tea tax was such a great thing in Boston. Uh, this is uh, actually some of this porcelain is Chinese. Somehow, Chinese porcelain made its way to England and then to Lebanon. Um, <laughs> in the uh, late 18th century. <clears throat> American too, uh, particularly by the storage vessels. And then that's just uh, all from one side, all these different kinds. I like this one especially. That's a transfer, a sort of early decal type technology found in English uh, Staffordshire, transfer printed. Now, the other tavern that we had a chance to excavate um, 
was this site in Preston, right across the river from the casino, the Mohegan Casino, and immediately adjacent to the shipyard where the frigate Confederacy was built at the time of the American Revolution. And as soon as he found out that there was going to be a shipyard there, Ebenezer Story said to himself, what every shipyard needs is a tavern. <laughs> And uh, so he actually got a special bill before the legislature to give him a tavern license because he had missed the January deadline. And he set up a tavern in this building that stood on what are the former grounds of the Norwich State Hospital. He did make a mistake, however. Um, once the Confederacy was completed, he and a lot of other local people crewed the vessel, went out on a cruising on the vessel. Immediately, well, almost immediately, within the year, got captured by the British, and Ebenezer's story spent the rest of the Revolutionary War in New York in a British prison. Oh. He died in prison. Oh. Leaving his wife all this time to run the tavern. Many, many colonial taverns were run by women, either uh, on their own, or more often, their husband had started a tavern, he died, like Ebenezer's story, and the wife took it over. Because really, when you think about it, the wife was doing most of the work anyways. The a tavern was essentially a household family type of operation. You're cooking for people, you're uh, serving people, you're... <coughs> allowing people to sleep there, you're making up beds, you're doing washing, etc. The woman was always doing most of the work, and in many cases, uh, they took over uh, once the husband was no longer on the scene. Uh, Mary's story, uh, Ebenezer's story's widow, ran this tavern for at least 10 or 15 years after uh, his death, and then one of her children uh, took it over. It was probably one of the ways that women were able to gain a fair amount of economic uh, accumulation. Again, you find tons and tons of dinnerware and uh, drinking vessels, all kinds of domestic and imported uh, ceramics. Because even though they're shipyard work, all right, I said it was for shipyard workers, which is true. But also, this Revolutionary War Tavern uh, that entertained a constant flow of high-ranking visitors that came to check on the progress of the ship. So people were coming from the state government, people were coming from the national government uh, to see how the ship was coming along. Uh, and so they, they had some pretty high-powered uh, visitors. And so these Chinese, or possibly a British imitation of Chinese ceramics, uh, were found there. We cross-mended a few of them, so they look more whole than when they were found. Oh, this is one of those uh, uh, communal drinking pots, faucet pots, that was passed from one person to another. Yeah. It's pretty big, you can see from the scale, and even though it's a metric system. Mm -hmm. Again, the uh, square bottom liquor bottles. These were called case bottles because they could all be packed together into a square or rectangular case and uh, shipped much more safely than round bottles could. You find a lot of coins at Tavern. There wasn't a lot of money around in colonial America, in early national period America. But uh, because people were traveling, they couldn't rely on credit. Now, the locals would get credit at the tavern, right? they run off a bill, they'd settle with the tavern keeper uh, once a year or however much, and uh, so forth. But if, if you were serving a traveler, you wanted actual cash money, right? You didn't want to say, oh, when I come through next year, I'll pay my bill. So uh, there's a fair amount of coins of all types found at tavern signs. And uh, coins were not just American coins, in fact they were much more likely to be British coins, like those at the bottom, those are British coins, um, and Spanish coins, because Britain and Spain were coining the most money. 
and it sort of filtered through to other parts of the world. Uh, again, the almanacs will tell you uh, what these coins really were worth, whether they were worth their face value or not. People dealt in multiple uh, currencies at the time. They didn't have a choice. They, they, you know, if somebody wanted to pay with a Spanish silver dollar, you know, unless you thought it was totally fake, you would take it. This is a real interesting coin. I think it's a half penny, uh, and I think it's British, but it's drilled out. And this was a very popular form of personal ornamentation on the part of colonial period African Americans. They were very partial to wearing coins as, as necklaces. Um, and uh, that's what this probably is. Now we know that many of the shipyard workers uh, that were building the Confederacy in the late 1770s were uh, either Indians from the Mohegan uh, um, Reserve across the river or were African Americans. So this is uh, not proof, but uh, suggestive of an African American presence at a tavern. And suggestive of the fact that you got people not only from the locale, but also from afar, all mixing together. Now, at the end of the tavern era occurred about 1820 or 1830. And how do we account for this? Well, the first part was that tolerance toward consumption of alcoholic beverages began to change. People, the whole culture was becoming more sentimental, more religious, and more anti-liquor. Uh, the uh, 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 demon rum, that concept that any amount of liquor was going to do you in, really came in in that period and culminated in Connecticut and many other states in the passage of the Maine Law, which outlawed the sale of spirits, of alcohol. Well, you can't have much of a tavern if you're not serving alcohol, right? Uh, and in some towns, apothecaries, drugstores, actually sort of took the place of taverns because the law exempted consumption of alcohol or sale of alcohol for, quote, medicinal purposes. And that's where that expression comes from, is the main law of, the, of uh, around 1850. Um, if you look at some of the, there's evidence that some of these apothecaries were selling it by the barrel full. So, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of medicinal purposes. <laughs> uh, and it did become, a, it, it, you know, the days when they would put up a congregational church and buy gallons and gallons of rum for the workers. Um, the days when they would have militia training and gallons and gallons of rum would be provided to the people who were doing the soldiers' training on the town of Green. Those days were gone. And it was no longer considered socially acceptable to drink to that extent. Probably more important is the coming of the railroads. The taverns thrived during the turnpike era, when people were traveling overland. But when the railroads came through, two things. Travel was much faster. And it, the, uh, lodging tended to concentrate in the cities. So you take the train from New York, stop in New Haven, stop in Hartford, and there would be a railroad hotel right near the station. That's where you'd stay. People were no longer traveling from point to point overland. So that really spelled the death knell of the, tra of the tavern era. But for many years, the tavern was the center of social life for the towns. It was the center for political information. That's where people would meet for political purposes. Sometimes masons would meet in the local tavern. Uh, it was the place for locals to interact with outsiders. And it was a real economic boost for the people who were able to participate in this and have those tavern licenses. And it went on for many years, from the earliest days of the Connecticut colony, when towns were required to have at least one tavern. Towns were required in the 17th century to appoint one person to be the tavern. Uh, right through the, um, all the 1700s and early 1800s, 
Taverns were an important part of American life. So that's the end. Thank you very much. Spinster that lived with her mother. 
So uh, she was filling up her liquor bottle at the, at the local tavern. There was no stigma to it. I, I think, uh, I think if anything, women were probably busy enough that they were not, they didn't have as much time to spend in taverns. You know the old saying, a man works from sun up to sundown, but a woman's work is never done. You know what I'm saying? Sun up to sundown. Right, a woman's work is but a woman's work is never done. Okay, so after sundown, the man spent some time, right? He can go to the tower and so forth. She's still doing the kids, the washing, the spinning, and everything else. I think if women participated less in tavern life, it had to do with the fact they're probably just a lot busier. What was the legal age drink? Um, it wasn't one. And again, I think it would have depended upon sort of uh, custom at the time. I mean, I'm sure that really small children uh, were not to be found there, except maybe to go and bring daddy home. <laughs> um, they couldn't enter taverns, so. though. And I suspect that young men uh, of a working age uh, that seemed to be responsible would be served. So no, there was no law for the minimum age. Just custom. Well, thank you all, all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.